Um, before we get started, the board would like to acknowledge that today is um, Jeff Mulligan's last hearing. Um, he is going on to bigger and better things uh, at the end of the month. And uh, I think we just wanted to express our thanks. He's been here for over eight years. And uh, it's been my experience that he's been extremely professional, kept us together when perhaps we were a little askew, um, and uh, has been a real consummate professional. And I personally wanted to thank him, um, put that on the record. I know that my fellow commissioners would also like to say something. Um, Commissioner uh, Alton Brown. Jeff, your abundant zoning knowledge and expertise has been very helpful and very much appreciated. More importantly, your guidance and your steady hand and your able management of the back office has had everyone working like a well-oiled machine. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you, and I wish you a lot of luck in your future endeavor. You will really be missed. Uh, likewise, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff operated behind the scenes, making everything run smoothly. I commented the other day to some of the people working in the office that I've never worked in an office where everybody got along and did their job so well. And I think a lot of this has to do with Jeff's leadership and we will miss you very much. Good morning, this is the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals special uh, public hearing for August 19, 2014. We'll begin with the special order calendar, decision items, item number one. 61152 BC, 3535 24th Street, Queens. Motion to grant. Aye. Commissioner Hinkson. Aye. Commissioner Montanez. Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown. Aye. Item number two, 75178 BZ, 15 Northern Boulevard, Queens. Good morning, Hiram Roth Group for Roth Group and Roth Group. Motion to grant. Commissioner Hinkson? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown? Aye. Thank you. Item number three, 169 BZ, 246, 248 West 80th Street, Manhattan. Motion to grant. Commissioner Hinkson? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown? Aye. Thank you, commissioners. And uh, to Jeff, thank you for your courtesy and your assistance throughout your tenure, and best of luck. Item number four, 7211BZ, 10106 Astoria Boulevard, Queens. Good morning, John Ronan appearing on behalf of my employer, the applicant. Motion to grant. Motion to grant. Commissioner Hinkson. Aye. Commissioner Montanez. Aye. Commissioner Adley Brown. Aye. Thank you. Continued hearing items. Item number five, 245-32BZ, 12305, 101st Street, Queens, 101st Avenue, sorry, Queens. Uh, this item has been adjourned. Um, I believe that we can have a submission date October 7th with the hearing on October 29th. Item number six, 76550BZ, 143036 Unionport Road, the Bronx. Mr. Coons? Kenneth Coons. I uh, don't think that the board had any further questions for you. You, you cleared up uh, the embalming issue. So, uh, um, if uh, there are any speakers who'd like to speak on this matter, then I think we can close. Motion to close. Motion to close. Commissioner Hinkson? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown? Aye. And we'll set a decision for September 16th. 16th? Yes. Thank you very much. Item number <coughs> 7, 997 84 BZ, 798 804 Union Street, Brooklyn. Morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Irving Menken for Sheldon Lobel, PC. Uh, we've had several hearings, and I believe I've uh, addressed all of the issues or attempted to address all of the issues that were raised by this board, by the community board, to the best of my knowledge, by the uh, adjacent property owners. And I, I see that the uh, board itself has two nagging questions that are still there. I would like to address one of them, and I'm going to ask the architect, Christian Zambrano, to 
address the other one. Uh, he's much more competent to do so than myself. The one that I would like to speak of is the issue about the existing bulkhead, uh, whether it can remain while at the same time adding a, another bulkhead there for meeting building code requirements. The uh, section 1141 of the zoning under which we are here as the SOC application uh, includes a, re a requirement that we comply with section 5231. Uh, Article section 5231 indicates that in community board six as well as in a multitude of community districts in Manhattan it has specific requirements to facilitate conversion of existing non-complying buildings to residential use and in this particular case section 1510 has only uh, three specific bulk provisions uh, in addition to the provision of 1141 that would have allowed an enlargement or a possible enlargement for the consideration of the board, all other things being equal, we are shrinking the building by bringing it into compliance with the bulk. That the three items that uh, the, uh, are referred to are in section 15-10, which indicates the number of dwelling units as permitted. That would allow 65, we're only doing 28, less than half of what 15-10 would allow. The light and air requirements, uh, recognizing that you can't cut the building down by 30 or 40 percent and meet all new building requirements. Uh, <coughs> section 277 of the MDL is the yardstick, and we have demonstrated compliance with that by chopping off a piece of the rear of the building. The uh, other bulk item, uh, the open space equivalent requirements, which requires 30 percent of the roof area for uh, open space equivalent with this planning commission recognizing you can't work with what there isn't there on the ground. The, in this particular case, the, uh, the architect has provided 48% of the roof area as open space equivalent. So insofar as the existing bulk of the building, we respectfully suggest that it meets the requirements of the zoning and the only addition is that required by the building code and here again, the zoning steps in and says, if you stay within these limitations, it's not a, not, it's a permitted obstruction. And uh, the architect, who I'm going to ask to address the balcony issue, that is, is an ongoing concern with the community board and the adjacent property owners, and last but not least, the board, he's going to address that issue as well as answer any more detailed questions that you might have on what I've been talking about with the roof structure. If I may, I, I'd like I to- I know that Commissioner Montanez had the specific question about the bulkhead and whether or not it was going to be um, considered oh. a permitted right. obstruction. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, I'm if it was gonna still, uh, it's a permitted obstruction now, yeah. but it's converted to residential, is it still committed, considered a permitted obstruction? Well, yes, it's a permitted obstruction because it's a permitted obstruction just as all the rest of the non-complying floor area. So it's no more non-permitted than the floor immediately below it. The, bu the building is... Doesn't it increase the degree of non-compliance? No, I, I, I don't believe so, but I would like, again, Mr. Zambrano to address that in, in more detail to your satisfaction, if I may. Uh, Christian? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Christian Zambrano. Uh, so regarding the existing bulkhead, um, that existing bulkhead is used as elevator machinery uh, for the two car elevators that are currently there now. So what we're doing is we're maintaining that bulkhead and reusing the square footage as residential space. But you're converting that existing structure to a residential unit. Correct which we are allowed under the uh, Article 1, Chapter 5. So that the, the idea of it being a permitted obstruction is, it's, it's can, it can still, re the structure itself can still remain sort of a permitted um, structure within that area regardless of the change of its usage. Correct. That's your. And then also regarding the balconies, um, I just, I wanted to know more your concerns 
Um, at the last meeting, we had removed the access to the, the second floor terrace, which is uh, where we're stepping back the building. Uh, we still, I still would like the handrail for s safety issues. We removed the doors and made them windows and then removed the balconies on the third floor completely. Now, um, I was wondering if you had done that because they're not really permitted within the minimum distance. No, they are permitted within, within that five foot setback. We're so not going over the property line. They are permitted obstructions in the rear. <coughs> Correct. Well, I know that the community still has concerns regarding those balconies and um, have you looked at reducing the depth of the balconies? We have looked at reducing the depth, um, but can we speak to that after we hear their concerns? Um, certainly, but I, I think that um, we would like to have a, a full discussion about that. Okay. Um, I know that, that uh, my fellow commissioners also had reservations about having uh, balconies directly on, to, on the property line, regardless of how high up that was, to have them you know, directly over top of sort of private space. Um, seemed a, a little problematic and maybe there was the opportunity to um, uh, lessen the, the depth of, of a balcony so that at least you're not getting the impression that someone is actually looking over, you know, across the property line. So um, we will we'll hear, hear more from, I'm sure, um, opposition and you can respond. Okay, I know ownership has suggested that we um, enclose them with a um, like a temporary enclosure, a, a, a mesh system that is used around New York City. Uh, but I'll let them speak and then reply. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Minkin, did you have? We, we uh, discussed the concern of the board and obviously of the adjacent property owners. And uh, Mr. Zambrano indicated that one uh, poss pun possibly acceptable to all parties would be a permanent screening of the balconies that would uh, eliminate the concern of any safety issues. It, it would give the, actually the residents of the of the converted building, some privacy that uh, co-op owners and, and condo unit owners have uh, allowed, have provided for themselves, rather than have open open balconies. A alternative that to that that uh, the owner has authorized me to indicate is that the built of balconies can be shrunk, but obviously, if you're less than five feet, uh, it becomes potentially dangerous to allow people to go out. So that that would mean we'd have a, a French style balcony, I forget the, um, forgive me for not knowing the exact term, and, and that way the there will be windows opening to it, and there will be no functional use of the balconies on the upper levels. That's another option. Uh, on, on that score, we believe that the communities or the adjacent property owners' concerns will be fully addressed, and there will be nothing but windows uh, and an appendage uh, can't leave it out from the wall, uh, but it's not on their property. It's several feet back, and if that will put the issue to rest, the owner is willing to do that. So, but we would prefer really the balconies that we think are not obtrusive, that they are allowed all around the city uh, as a permanent obstruction and required open space, yards, building spacing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and even up to two, almost two feet are even allowed to project beyond the street line. So it's not, it's a common, common ups, uh, appendage to a building. Uh, it's not meant to be an encroachment or impingement on the adjacent property owners. It's something that we think will actually enhance the appearance of the real wall of the building. Understood. Um, if you have no further um, comments, I would open it up to. Uh, uh, no, I. I do you, do you wish to speak, John? No, no. We've we've indicated our desire. Our desire. Or it's really optional. It's unusual that normally we come to the board and we indicate what we want, and this board says yes or no. 
In this case, we do wish to have the limited length along the rear wall. They are not the length of the wall. They're uh, approximately 20 percent of the length of the rear wall in the aggregate. They extend that only five feet. Shrinking it for functional use becomes problematic. So one alternative we suggest is permanent screening. The alternative is to make them non-functional but still architecturally uh, appear, uh, making the, enhancing the appearance by having these French balconies with no doors opening. Thank you. Uh, are there any speakers on this item? You'll be given three minutes. Morning. Jonathan DeRoe, 790 Union Street. When this process began in May, the lawyer for the project attempted to slip the conversion past the community by ignoring the requirement to publicize the meeting to the affected neighbors. When that failed and facing public outcry, the owners promised to listen to the community and modify the plans to minimize the negative impacts. While I credit Mr. Meltzer for meeting with neighbors and listening to their grievances, the subsequent de minimis changes to the plan suggest that the listening tour was just for show. While the development team has highlighted its ties to Brooklyn and the supposed benefits conversion will have for the neighborhood, the simple fact is that the neighborhood does not need or want an oversized luxury rental building with no parking in the PS321 catchment area. It's my understanding that at the last BSA meeting, Mr. Meltzer said that his plan had been approved by CB6, but this statement requires qualification. First, the plan was only begrudgingly approved by CB6 in the face of overwhelming public disapproval because the members of the Land Use Committee didn't feel that they had the legal standing to prevent the project from advancing. Their approval, however, was conditional, and the most recent plans submitted to the BSA do not meet these conditions. CB6 stipulated that there be no balconies on the building and that a portion of the housing be affordable, as championed by our new mayor, a former Park Slope resident. If the owners wanted community approval for this project, they would, at a minimum, have incorporated the changes required by the CB6 approval. Not doing so is a slap in the face of the community and should not be tolerated by this board. Thank you. Next speaker. State your name for the record. Susan Heron, 813 President Street. Uh, I would like to mention also Susan Antonio from 809 President Street, I believe submitted two letters, but you had a uh, funeral of a family member today, so that's why she's not here. Our thoughts are with her as well as hers are with us. Uh, I'd like to read a letter I submitted to uh, Acting Chair Christopher Collins. I'd just like to read it. Uh, Dear Mr. Collins, thank you for again allowing me to include my thoughts and hopes in regard to the renovation of the parking garage at 800-804 Union Street, the property directly adjacent to my backyard. The New York City Board of Standards and Appeals and Community Board 6 are well aware of the positions on both sides. I would like to express a few final comments with respect thereto. All of the parties involved will experience life changes as a result of this project. <coughs> balconies or no balconies, Juliet or otherwise, will not change the fact that the apartments on Union Street will allow peering eyes to gaze upon our private yards and rear windows at will. There's no changing the fact that our privacy will be greatly diminished even with minimal changes to the rear of the garage building. It is my hope that the board will allow only the barest essentials in that regard. Mr. Meltzer will still have the advantage of creating a facade on Union Street, which he expressed would add something beautiful to the neighborhood and certainly will add great financial gain to him. In contrast, the seven buildings on President Street and particularly the four whose properties directly abut the Union Street garage could see a decrease in overall property value as well as less rental income. We all know that Park Slope is a very desirable neighborhood and many people would love to rent or buy in this area. At present, our rear yards face a huge facade of ivy-covered bricks, and we seldom see any activity from the parking garage, creating a somewhat tranquil feel in an often bustling area on the neighboring streets around us. With the alteration to a huge facade of brick and clear glass windows, some pr prospective buyers or renters might consider a different location. And thus, we may lose a month or much more income while Mr. Meltzer has increased his. With an optimistic outlook, I request the board to favorably consider our appeal to approve the recommendations of Community Board 6, which so encouraged us. 
and to go even further to protect the longtime residents and proud owners of seven properties in this vibrant community as opposed to the one party in opposition. Uh, I just want to make one short comment, what was just mentioned about the Juliet balconies giving a more aesthetic look to the building. However, that's the part of the building that we're seeing. So we don't really want to see the balconies. It can look beautiful in the front, and everyone on Union Street walking by, residents, everyone will see it. But for us, we're the ones seeing that part of the building. We don't really need to look at balconies. Thank, Thank you very much. Next speaker. Hello. Okay, my name is Lorraine Schramm, and I'm the owner of 807 President Street. Uh, my husband bought this building in 1976, and if he was alive today, he would give you a more enlightened and educated response to this appeal, but instead, you're stuck with me. As we are all small property owners, we are very concerned about the enormity of this project at the Union Street Garage. We hear every day about the loss of privacy, and this is just another example. We worry about our security and privacy concerning the proposed balconies. Whether they are on the upper floors only or Juliet balconies, this will still decrease our privacy and heighten the noise level with renters on these balconies. This in effect decreases the value of our properties and our quality of life. This is simply not a good idea. Having Juliet balconies on the front of the building sounds great since it's a commercial street. I ask the board to think of the future and see how this project will affect the privacy, security, and protection of the Park Slope neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning. I'm Charles Matthews. Uh, my wife Susan Heron and I are the owners of 813 President Street. I would like to address what we've invested infrastructure, that house, that street, the neighborhood. We've spent nearly 40 years doing that. It's a long process. We've done great renovations, beautiful garden. We worked very hard to make this neighborhood what it really is. I'd like to talk briefly about the people simple, average people who go to work every day, pay their taxes, and help to build this. Some of the people, though, are very professional. I came home one day, there was a guy leaning on my fence, waiting for a meeting next door. It was our senator, Schumer. On Saturdays, we have a great stoop sale. We're famous for that in Park Slope. That's what we do. The wife and I just meander. We go from one to another. We like it. At 75, I like to walk. I like to see things and do things. While I'm composing my music, I like doing that. So one Saturday, we are along 9th Street, 6th Avenue. We see this tall guy walking very slow with his wife behind him. They look just, just like common laborers very tired. We waved to him, said hello. We didn't bother them. We knew they had worked hard. But we are going to be paying for where they're going to be staying now. They're our neighbors now. But they're going to, they are now in Gracie Mansion. There are a lot of people. Now there's a little boy that comes by my stoop. And he plays baseball. So we talked about the sacrifice fly, the sacrifice bunt, how you move a runner over to score. Each of us have bunted, we've sacrificed. We only ask that you remember we built something here that we would like to see you acknowledge, not to take anything from Union Street, but just remember those who sacrifice bunt. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. 
Hi there, I'm Dave Nimmons. I'm the owner of 803 President. I'm going to assume you've read the letter submitted, so I'm not going to just read it to you, but kind of try to encapsulate. Um, so Community Board 6 said no balconies. Um, the last proposal that was floated here when the invitation from this board was to rebut the arguments that came from the last time <coughs> suggested some balconies. Our position remains what CB6's position was, which is no balconies. That's what the conditional approval, that's one of the terms of the conditional approval and it hasn't been met under the current plan. Whether we're talking about fewer balconies or higher balconies or screened balconies or Juliet balconies, we're still, they're still talking about balconies. Our position all the way through, and this is not only my position but that of seven owners and the 60 odd people who live in these buildings and even what I've heard from you today are that there are real concerns about these balconies going out to the lot line. So in the clearest, simplest terms, what I would say is please do not approve this project with balconies. We've made a lot of arguments about why they're not particularly necessary. Those have even, I think, sort of been validated today by the idea that, well, we could just make them Juliet balconies. Um, I feel like the, the topic in this that has the most clear consensus is no balconies. So I just want to reiterate that from all the parties who've said it and ask you to take that into consideration in your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Are there no more speakers? Mr. Minkin. My client has instructed me to advise the board that they are willing to remove all the balconies at the rear. Thank you. And we'll submit revised plans reflecting that. Wonderful. Um, if we have nothing further to comment on, um, I would like to close the hearing. Motion to close. Commissioner Hankson? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown? Aye. Uh, when do you think you could make a submission to us? When do you have the plans? No, no more than a week. We'll can, can hopefully uh, allow us an extra week to be sure that we have it's correct. So why don't you submit on the 9th and we could vote this out on the 23rd? I'm sorry, repeat the date submit please? Submit on the 9th September. of September. Okay. A and submission? Uh, yes. Yes. And and we'll vote this out on the twenty third. Oh, um, and perhaps the opposition would like to submit as well. If the opposition could submit by uh, the sixteenth, and then we'll hold that schedule to the twenty third. Twenty first. Twenty third. Twenty third. Is, is decision. Thank you. Next item. Item number eight. 8892BZ, 3007 East Tremont Avenue, the Bronx. Mr. Coons. Good morning, Kenneth Coons. Good morning. Um, I think the only open issue I probably was an issue of landscaping, but um, perhaps Commissioner Otley Brown would like to, uh, yes, to talk about that a bit. In the last hearing, I had asked for the striping as well as the landscaping, and I noticed that you did stripe the parking lot, but you did not increase the landscaping alongside the residential border. And I was wondering if the reason why was because to take from the parking lot to put in the landscaping would possibly cramp your aisle widths and make it kind of hard for cars to get around. Yes, we'd lose some spots in doing that. Uh, I didn't realize that I just completely ignored it and I didn't address it. Beside that, there is a six foot high solid fence at the back of all the properties, uh, which only opens to the, their sellers, so that it, any further landscaping would be um, to no avail, of, you know, of any good purpose. And there's a lot of uh, shrubbery, greenery, all kinds of stuff, trees that is uh, growing over the fence and behind the fence. So I thought the uh, loss of the parking would be uh, a worse issue than uh, any additional landscaping. Okay, that's pretty much what I figured, so I, I accept it. 
I don't think we had any other issues. Um, are there any speakers on this item? No speakers, then um, I think we can close the hearing and set a decision date. Motion to close. Commissioner Hickson? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Atley Brown? Aye. And we can vote this out uh, September 16th. September? 16. Fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item number nine. 16000 BZ 224404 Francis Lewis Boulevard Queens Vassalati Associates. Good morning, Hiram Worth Group for Vassalati Associates. Uh, I don't believe we had any further issues um, with this case. Uh, are there any speakers on this item? No speakers. Then I uh, put forth a motion to close. Commissioner Hinkson? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Atley Brown? Aye. And we'll set the decision for September 16. Terrific. Thank you very much. Item number 10, 15207BZ, 8701 4th Avenue, Brooklyn. Hello. Good morning, Eric Palatnik. I believe you probably heard our comments from we, yesterday. We did. I believe it pertained to the sprinklering of, this, of the subject space at the second floor. And it is not sprinkled. Uh, the first floor is sprinkled. There's a drugstore there, but the second floor is not. Uh, we did speak to our architect over the evening uh, and asked him what it would cost to in install sprinklers. And uh, the cost is somewhat prohibitive. It's uh, twenty-five dollars to $30,000 to install the sprinkler system at that floor. Uh, so we're hoping within the board's discretion that uh, the application could move forward without the sprinklers being installed. Uh, but we deferred to the board, of course. You do have some sprinklers, though. We, we do. Still. We have it in, in uh, the bathroom, I believe, has, has a sprinkler. But uh, the rest of the space is not sprinklered. Yes, the prior resolution stated that um, you were, the PC was going to come into compliance with the fire department requirement requirement for full sprinkling of the space, and you installed six sprinklers. Right. What I'd like to do maybe is if we can have the opportunity to bring it back to the fire department to see if the six sprinklers that are in place will satisfy that their requirements uh, as opposed to installing additional sprinkler heads. Um, I think we can accommodate that. Um, if you would submit a new plan to the uh, to the fire department, um, how how long do you think it would take? We could submit that? within two weeks to th within a week to the fire department, but I imagine they probably need two to three weeks to respond, and it's Labor Day. So. Okay, so that puts you probably at getting back to us with anything around September 16th. That'll be great. And we can hear it um, October 7th. Thank you. Are there any speakers on this item? You have your schedule. Thank you. New cases, item number 11, 25408 BZ, 1214 East 15th Street, Brooklyn. Good morning again, Eric Palatnik. Uh, I don't think we had any additional comments to make on this. Any speakers on this item? Seeing no speakers, I make a motion to close. Vice uh, Commissioner Hinkson. Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown? Aye. And we can set the decision for September 16th. Thank you. Item number 12, 6891BZ, 22315 Union Turnpike, Queens. Good morning, Josh Reinsmith for the applicant. Uh, I don't think we had anything further. Oh, I'm sorry. You had a landscaping box on the corner of the lot, and I was, it didn't look as if it had been planted at all okay. in your, your photos. Are you planning on planting it? Yeah, and I, I spoke with uh, my client regarding this, and they're happy to, to take care of that right away. I just wanted to confirm that it's the landscaping box right at the intersection yes. of Union and Springfield? Yes. Okay. That's something we can do, and I can submit photographs of that. Anything further? Any speakers on this item? So why don't we um, set a submission date for those photos? When do you think you could get that to us? Uh, certainly within a week. So if you could get that to us, I guess, by the end of August? Okay. Um, let's see if I have the date. So if we did a submission date for September 2nd, which would be right after Labor Day, is that sufficient? Actually, that would be fine. If you could, yeah, if you could give it to us September 2nd, um, we could vote this out on the 16th. Great. Great. Motion to close. Commissioner Hinkson. Aye. Commissioner Montanez. Aye. Commissioner Atley Brown. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item number 13, 76-12BZ, 148 Norfolk Street, Brooklyn. 
Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Good morning. Good morning. I suppose you heard our comments from yesterday. We did. Um, very briefly, as the board is aware, this is an application for an amendment of an existing special permit, which was granted at an FAR of 0.9. Um, in relation to the uh, to Superstorm Sandy and the uh, the uh, damage to the existing home of the premises in November 2012, in addition to the uh, regulations implemented by the city for storm safety, um, the removal of cellars, et cetera, raising of buildings, uh, the applicant here is seeking to amend the special permit to allow for a greater floor area, which would exist at a 1.1. I know that the board at the executive session had questions with regards to that number. Um, and so I'd say briefly two things. The first is that with regards to the building, the approved FAR in 2012, as was approved by the board, was uh, approximately 2,800 square feet. Uh, there was also a cellar in there, which was about 1,100 square feet, which would, understanding that a cellar doesn't count as floor area, give about 3,900 square feet of usable square footage. The home now is unable to maintain a cellar given the regulations and is now seeking an additional 618 square feet of space. So in effect, the addition to the building here doesn't even compensate for the loss of the cellar space. And I know that the board had talked about that and said we really needed to justify that. So I guess as a first point, I'd say that understanding as Commissioner Hinkson commented that there will be more of these cases now. Um, that as a, as a guideline, we're not even able to make up the space that we've lost. And the second thing I'd note is that the community board in the amendment, so they looked at this amendment and actually voted even more overwhelmingly than they did in the initial application. They voted 28 to one in favor, finding in essence that this proposed building is within the character <coughs> of the area. This is not uh, a mystery given the fact that many people here were encountering hardships from Superstorm Sandy and that the building will essentially be the same with the exception of these longer floor plates for the attic. So it was a 28 to one vote in favor of this proposed enlargement. Given that the statute and 73622 does not designate a, a, a black line, a, you know, a black and white number with regards to the square footage, we would ask the board to allow this minor overage here uh, in line with what the community board has approved and more importantly in line with what the board has authority to do under the zoning resolution as well as um, something which is overall within the character of the area. Would you be able to provide us with a survey of the area, sort of some empirical evidence um, that perhaps 1.1 is within the character of the neighborhood? We would, and we cited a number of examples on Norfolk Street where the uh, FAR was between 0.99 and 1, so uh, you know, a healthy number, as well as other properties within Community Board 15 where it was over 1.0. 1 so, but we'd be happy to, to submit a, a little bit more of a broader uh, range to show the board that really, while it is on the higher end, it is not, um, it is not uh, an outrageous number. Right, just to codify what you're sure. saying so that we, we can see that. Uh, Commissioner Montanez, I believe you had further questions concerning uh, mitigation measures and yes. um, compliance. Yes, I referred to the executive order, but there are now new zoning regulations regarding special flood hazard areas and um, a couple of things might impact this property one being that you're supposed to have a, a, a visual mitigation measure when you're lifting the house up um, sort of a front porch or a stair that changes direction or elevated landscaping so if the architect could look at that sure and in addition um, knowing that people are going to be losing their cellars, you're allowed mechanical space in the attic that doesn't limit you to 50 square feet. So if you could look at that and see if you could reduce what you know, you're asking for. Yeah, I think given that we'll, we'll likely, well, I would, I would uh, step back a moment. The architect has been in conversation with DOB. I know that there was um, a discussion of beautification measures. They put lattice work along the, along the boundary of the, the lower part of the home. But I do also know that some of that attic space is devoted to mechanical. So, um, so uh, we'd be happy to look at that and, and in essence perhaps bring our FAR down. And your original plans didn't have any landscaping at all? So. We'll take a look at that as well. I guess the only thing I'd ask the board at this point, understanding that, there, of course, there may be additional comments, is that um, 
the uh, the approval was initially in issued in a in um, November 2012, which actually postdates Sandy by about a month. The homeowner here has been um, uh, has been unable to utilize or really to build out the home uh, in in the uh, pendency of of that. Uh, that occurrence and this case so to the extent the board can expedite any schedule we'd be greatly appreciative we will take that into consideration thank you um, are there any speakers on this item any speakers uh, how long do you think it will take you to give us a submission on these items um, we'd be able to resubmit within two weeks so if you could submit say on September 2nd we can continue the hearing on September 16th. Thank you, Commissioner Hinkson. I, I'm assuming that, I, I'm not sure, but uh, is it possible if the if we satisfied the board at that time that we'd be able to get a closing grant, or is that We'll premature? take that under consideration. Thank you, I appreciate it. Appeals calendar decision items. Item number 14, 296.13A, 280 Bond Street, Brooklyn. Uh, good morning, Jack Lester for the appellant. Motion to grant. Commissioner Hinkson? No. Commissioner Montanez? No. Commissioner Otley Brown? No. Thank you. Item number 15, 9214A, 797th Avenue, Manhattan. Good morning, Nick Williams, Greenberg Chari for the applicant. Motion to grant. Commissioner Hinkson? Aye. Commissioner Montanez. Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown. Aye. Thank you. Continued hearing items. Item number 16 and 17, 16612A and 10713A, 638 East 11th Street, Manhattan. These two items have been adjourned. Um, we have scheduled a submission date for October 7th, and the hearing date will be October 21st. Item number 18, 18 110.13a, 120 President Street, Brooklyn. Christian Elton, applicant. Uh, Oral Goldstein, formerly Abrams Fensterman. Uh, we have submitted a letter of withdrawal to the board and we thank the commissioners for their indulgence. So received, thank you. Sorry. New cases, item number 19, 300. 08A, 3935 27th Street, Queens, the office of Marvin Mitzner. Good morning, Marvin Mitzner, the applicant. I understand that I suppose that you heard our comments from yesterday. Yes, I did. <clears throat> Just to clarify, uh, this is an extension of time, a request for an extension of time on a common law vested rights case. Uh, since the uh, grant of the vested rights, the owner has acquired an adjacent parcel and included that in his development project. But the development of that adjacent parcel is as of right for that parcel. So therefore, there is no increase in the degree of noncompliance, any new noncompliance created by that addition. Have you effectu effectuated a, a lot merger? Yes, here? we have. So it's, it's part of the same zoning lot? It's part of the same zoning lot and also part of the same tax lot. And so why wouldn't a change in the zoning lot come back to us under our jurisdiction? Well, because we've had a, we've, we've been vested. So in terms of, in terms of the ability to amend that permit, that permit should be amendable without coming back to this board, so long as the amendment doesn't create any non, new noncompliance. Maybe you okay. could speak, speaking of noncompliances, maybe you could speak a little bit about, um, you now sort of have an outboard elevator shaft that rises nine stories from your new lot. Mm -hmm. So I question whether or not um, that is going to increase your, um, you know, noncompliance on that lot. I I would think that it would, and I'm not sure exactly why you don't think it does. <laughs> well, we'll take a look at that specific issue and address that. Yeah, and I, I think we've we've asked, we've reached out to DOB, and um, they've given us a preliminary response. But I think that we were we're going to pursue this a, a little bit further. That's fine. I have no problem with the, the, board, the building department weighing in on the, on the as of right nature of that uh, enlargement. Fine. Um, Commissioner Otley Brown, I think that you had some um, concerns as well. Um, yes, could you address the 
serious loss that you would incur if you're not allowed to continue construction and would have to construct according to the new zoning. That's usually what we ask for in our common law vested rights cases. Um, we could do I, I, we could do that, but frankly, uh, since the since the vested rights was granted, we we've, we've completed construction of the superstructure. So yes, certainly just, the yeah, serious loss would be even greater than it was before. But right, exactly. So, so you just do have that. to just um, quantify that in your narrative. Just sure. Quantify what that would mean. We can certainly do that. Commissioner Martinez. Yes, the amended plans that you submitted to us were they audited by the DOB? Were they what? Audited. Oh uh, yes, I believe they were. They were audited. Yes. Um, and uh, my other question had to do with the numerous open violations. If you could provide us evidence of how you're working to resolve them, some of them have to do with um, the netting and the, the timbers sticking out from the, the the building, and some of them were hazardous. How are they being resolved? All of those violations have been corrected. There has not been a reinspection to remove it of record, but in fact the the work involving the netting and, and other construction-related violations have all been cured. Um, okay, well, I saw at least we'll substantiate that. still open. We'll, excuse me? 15 violations still open. As I say, we haven't had a reinspection to remove them of record, but in fact, there is, a, there is a, a correction that was done, and we can provide you evidence of that. And perhaps you want to schedule a reinspection, especially on the hazardous violations? Certainly. Uh, are there any speakers on this item? No speakers. Um, when can you submit to us? Uh, we need about three weeks. Okay. So can you submit, let's say, by the 9th? Yes. And we will continue the hearing on the 23rd. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 202314A, 198-3550, 1st Avenue, Queens. Hello, good morning again, Eric morning. Palatnik. We attended your review session yesterday and we, we heard your comments. Uh, I believe the first question the board asked, there were, there were two questions that, that were asked, which the, the easier one is, uh, or the clearer one to answer is what would happen if the home had to actually be taken down and to be made compliant. And it would require uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of investment, both to the facade and the structure of the building, as well as to the reconfiguration of the dwelling units, because only one dwelling unit is permitted. And as you saw from the application materials, a two-family unit, two-family building or home has been constructed. So it would require quite a bit of work, the removal of all the plumbing that's in place and the electrical and the walls and the demising walls and replacing them, obviously, or eliminating them and reconfiguring and redesigning. Uh, we could submit to you after the hearing a more formal statement to this effect from the architect that will give it to you in writing, but that's the essence of why we cannot redesign the property. And, and back that up with some real figures. We'd be happy to. We have something We'd be to happy at. to. Uh, I believe the board's uh, second question was the trying to get a, a clearer handle on the total amount that's been spent or contracted for. Uh, I see Commissioner Montes no, is I shaking her head. So some tallies regarding what was spent prior to the rezoning and then after yes. the rezoning, but in order to get a percentage complete, um, what is the total project cost? Eight, Eighty-nine percent of the total project cost has been already been spent, and that's five hundred and thirteen thousand four hundred and twenty-nine dollars. Uh, the entire project cost is, I believe, uh, 500, it, it, it is, I don't believe it to be, it is 572,000. So the first number is 513429, and that's what's been completed already, and that's 89% of the 572,000. And we could again put that also in a clear statement after the hearing so that you have it in front of you. Yeah, I think that when we looked at this, I, I think we all sort of thought that if perhaps you could put it in some sort of spreadsheet form so that we can understand exactly what was spent, when it was spent, the percentage, We'd and be then, happy to. you know, grand totals, you know, across, across the lines. We'd be happy to. Uh, are there any speakers on this item? No speakers. Um, when can you submit? Uh, we can submit back, if we can, maybe uh, the week after, the week after Labor Day, so I forget what date that is. I think it's September 
can third you or September tenth um, by the ninth. Yes, we can. And we'll put this on for the twenty third. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Zoning calendar. Decision items. Item number 21, 211-12BZ, 164 Coffee Street, Brooklyn. Good morning. Hiram Rothkrug for Rothkrug and Rothkrug. Morning. Motion to grant. Commissioner Hinkson. Aye. Commissioner Montanez. Aye. Commissioner Adley Brown. Aye. Terrific. Thank you. Item number 22, 311-12BZ, 964 Dean Street, Brooklyn. Hello, good morning again, Eric Palatnik. Motion to grant. Commissioner Hinkson. Aye. Commissioner Montanez. Aye. Commissioner Atley Brown. Aye. Thank you. Item number 23, 6513BZ, 123 Franklin Avenue, Brooklyn. Hello. Are we requesting a deferral for environmental? Yes, testing? we are. Uh, do you have an idea of which Dave in this case is a little different than other board cases that we've had in manufacturing districts where DEP is actually requesting testing to be done now uh, so I don't necessarily have the time frame but if you could put us on a short maybe three or four weeks for us to resubmit we could update the board on where we are uh, we're hoping to be done with the testing in the next few weeks and then submitting to DEP well, why don't you try to submit to us by uh, September 23rd that gives you a full month that'll be great and you can catch us up. And if we uh, need to, we're gonna put you back on for the 21st, I guess that puts you the 21st of October. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 24, 266 13BZ, 515 East 5th Street, Manhattan. Good morning, Marvin Mitzner, the applicant. Uh, Mr. Mitzner, we're going to be deferring this pending the companion application. The NBL 310 application? Yes. Has a date been set for that to be restored uh, to the calendar? I believe it's September 16th. September 16th. September 16th. And will this, okay. And if, if we have to, we may reopen. I will this case track that or? Yes. yes, yeah. Okay, same date then. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. Item number 25, 27713 BZ, 11769 Fort George Hill, Manhattan. Jeffrey Chester for the applicant. Motion to grant. Susan, Commissioner Hinkson? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Adley Brown? Aye. Thank you very much. Item number 26, 29913 BZ. 4299 Highland Boulevard, Staten Island. Good morning again, Eric Palatnik. Motion to grant. Commissioner Hinkson. Aye. Commissioner Montanez. Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown. Aye. Thank you. Item number 27, 3-14BZ, 12-22 East 89th Street, Manhattan. Morning, Madam Chair. Commissioner Shelley Friedman for the applicant. Motion to grant. Commissioner Hinkson. Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown? Aye. Thank you. Item number 28, 27-14BZ, 496 Broadway, Manhattan. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Great. We received LPC communication. Now we're good to go with this. Motion to grant. Commissioner Hinkson? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown? Aye. Thank you. Continued hearing items. Item number 29, 300-12BZ, 36 West 93rd Street, Manhattan. Good morning, commissioners. Howard Weiss, David of Citron and Hutcher uh, for uh, the applicant Columbia Grammar. Um, we attended uh, the review session and uh, so we have nothing to add beyond our submissions that we've made and certainly if the board has any questions. I do have one housekeeping item if I may. Uh, we received as the board did last evening at uh, 6.54 p.m. a submission from Mr. Ray as an opposition which was uh, contrary to the submission schedule that was set by the board and in addition I believe violates the rules of procedure. 
We would ask that the board uh, decline to accept that submission. Uh, and uh, if the commissioners, however, would elect to do so, then we'd like to work out some appropriate uh, schedule after the hearing is closed for us to make uh, some response in writing. Okay. I don't think we had any further questions. Um, are there any speakers on this item? Please come forward. You've got three minutes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Hugh Zanger. I'm an attorney. I represent 322 Realty Corp. And I've been asked to read a statement into the record by that board. 322 Central Park West is an entirely residential multiple dwelling owned and operated by a cooperative community immediately to the east of Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School, CGPS. The owners of 322 Central Park West object to the proposed application by CGPS for a zoning variance which would permit CGPS to further expand the size of its school facility because of the additional traffic, noise, and disruption which an increase in the, in the size of the CGPS facility shall create. CGPS apparently needs this increase to turn its current big business into an even bigger one, which is insufficient legal grounds for this body to grant CGPS the variance in question. During the past 20 years, CGPS has been on a course of dramatic and unprecedented growth and has transformed itself from a school which enrolled about 400 students to a school that, which now enrolls about 1,300 students. Indeed, in 2000, CGPS obtained a zoning variance which permitted it to build an entirely new building. CGPS now wants to make itself even bigger and increase its capacity, and the owners of 322 Central Park West object. CGPS owns and operates a private school on a strip of land bounded by 92nd Street on its south side and 93rd Street on its north side in the eastern portion of the block between Central Park West and Columbus Avenue. According to its website, on this thin strip of land, CGPS has 642 students in its grammar school and 648 in its preparatory school for a total of 1,290 students. With its tuitions at approximately 40,000 per year per student, one could estimate that CGPS is a business which generates approximately $52 million in tuition per year in the heart of a residential neighborhood. Many residents of 322 Central Park West moved into the building at a time when CGPS was a small elite private school which enrolled only about 400 students in total on its premises. However, not long ago, apparently unsatisfied with being a small elite private school, CGPS turned itself into the big business it is today, and it tripled the size of its student body. During the past 20 years, CGPS has been permitted by the Board of Standards and Appeals to just explode in terms of its physical size and student populations, and among other things, erect an entirely new building in 2000. After 2000, many residents at 322 Central Park West found themselves staring into this brand new CGPS edifice because the Board of Standards and Appeals granted this zoning variance. Along with this influx of 900 additional students, every day there are all the traffic of a top private schools, the twice daily fleet of cars, SUVs, black cars, and taxi every morning before the first bell and every, noon, every afternoon when classes are dismissed, which renders 92nd Street, 92nd Street and 93rd Street impassable. You're going um, to have to conclude your three minutes yes. around. The owners of 322 Central Park West are in favor of CGPS fulfilling its mission of educating the next generation. But at this point, the further expansion will, will unreasonably detrimentally affect those owners and their rights to own and peaceably enjoy their building. Thank you. Thank you. Any further speakers? Morning, Commissioners. Juan Reyes, Safe Art Shaw, uh, partner. Um, you know, I simply am submitting a, um, a statement and letter um, addressing the concerns, and uh, I'll re partially read it in and like to submit it today, um, which has nothing to do with the schedule that Mr. Weiss is discussing. Um, as every well analysis is entitled to submit things on the day of the hearing. Um, as you know, we represent Westside Organization for Responsible Development, 
we submit this uh, letter in further opposition to Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School. Um, to address the community's concern, concerns regarding traffic and negative impacts that additional school enlargements would have on the public's health, safety, and welfare, and morals, we respectfully propose that uh, Columbia's application, if, it's, if granted, um, the resolution be conditioned as follows. First, Columbia must uh, prepare an overall plan in writing of how the school would address the traffic situation and share that the plan, that plan with the community so that a mutually agreeable solution can be reached. As previously explained, the traffic and noise situation in the area surrounding the school is unacceptable. Um, as we've been informed um, by our client, the situation is now critical as three pedestrians have died in traffic accidents within five, a five block radius of the proposed expansion. Despite the negative impact of the school's expansion has had on traffic in the neighborhood, there's been a lack of dialogue between Columbia and the community. The, the, uh, to emphasize this point, the school recently by, uh, bypassed the community board and had the DOT put up no parking signs in front of, in front of the West 92nd, in front of West 92nd Street, which is which is the street in front of a moderate and low-income apartment house. The school implemented implemented this change without notice to the community or the affected building. At the urging of the tenants in that building, who who, have, who are having their cars towed away, the community board will hold a hearing in this matter in September. Also, at the last hearing, uh, Vice Chair Collins specifically directed that the applicant meet with the representatives of the, West, uh, of the West Side organization to work out an agreement regarding the traffic situation. To date, the applicants have not met with the West Side organization representatives, and it's imperative that school be required to share any plan to address the traffic with the members of the community who are, who are the individuals most affected. Um, in addition, on July 21st, 2014, in a letter submitted by Sam Schwartz, they state they will conduct, conduct additional traffic, uh, traffic study in the fall to develop further recommendations to improve safety and operations. The community would like to be given the opportunity to review the traffic study before uh, any approval is given and discuss the solutions with the school. Um, notably, imposing conditions on Columbia with respect to the traffic situation would be proper in this case uh, to, to address the, the significant traffic issues that have already resulted from Columbia's prior expansions. And this will likely worsen the school's proposed ex expansion. Um, my other two points really are that enrollment has been very significant. Um, our, our records show an um, increase of 420 students that we've um, pulled from um, online sources and we've cited in the letter I'm submitting. Um, uh, Columbia says it's 219 students. Um, if there's no cap on the number of students that are allowed and uh, Columbia has specifically stated that they're only going to increase it by 30 students and if that's that's the case then in order to work with the community they should agree to only a 30 uh, student increase if there are an additional 10 can you wrap it up yeah 10 uh, if there are additional 10 classrooms you could have from 15 to 25 students in each classroom could be up to 20, uh, 250 students um, and uh, third we're asking that um, if they do do work um, that it be limited to the summer and not uh, be done on the on the weekend. But um, I will submit my letter. Thank Mr. you very Reyes, much. Mr. Reyes, I've got a question yeah. for you, clarification. Sure. Um, you mentioned a tra three traffic deaths. Are you saying that the school's traffic problems no, this is with, well, this is with to the three deaths? Uh, the overall situation is, is hazardous, and the overall situation within the five block radius is untenable and the untenable situation is but not result the school the, not in specifically itself. Um, itself no okay thank you next speaker okay where can i hand this in Give it okay, to thanks you. Ms. Thank you. good morning my name is beth gannon i am a resident and a member of the board of directors at 325 central park west which is immediately adjacent to columbia preps facilities um, the school simply isn't being transparent about what they're trying to do. They claim that they're trying to create a self-contained middle school, but they're seeking to double the size of the cafeteria in 36 West 93rd Street, but they're not putting a gymnasium in. They're putting a, they have a huge gymnasium in the high school building at 4 West 93rd Street, but they're not putting a cafeteria in there. They say they're trying to create two separate schools. They can't do it with the plans that they have submitted. What else they're trying to do, I can't understand or explain. 
it looks to me like they're simply trying to increase the size of their upper school facilities while using the creation of two separate schools as a cover. They say that they have spacious facilities on their public website, but they tell the BSA that they are overcrowded. Which one is it? They can't have it both ways. And on a personal note on the traffic situation, I have a child that I walk to school every day. We cross Central Park West at West 93rd Street during the heart of Columbia Prep drop-off. I can't tell you how many SUVs I have seen running that light in order to make the left-hand turn onto 93rd Street as we are trying to cross the street. I feel like we're taking our lives in our hands every single time. When we come out of the park at 5th Avenue and 90th Street, despite four bus lines, heavy truck traffic, and six private schools in a five block area, you don't see the same kinds of problems. The traffic situation at Columbia Prep has become absolutely untenable. This is just something that I can't fix, you can't fix, the school has to fix it. And until they have the problem in hand, until they have resolved the noise issues, the traffic issues, and their community relations issues, I ask that you at least adjourn making a decision on this variance. Leave it aside, let them fix the problems that they have already created, and then let them come back and ask for an expansion. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is David Rosenberg. I'm a resident at 35 West 92nd Street and a member of the board of that cooperative that, that owns that building. I'd like to speak to the C&D findings. Um, I know that this board does not typically second guess pronouncements as to pedagogical needs and programmatic requirements. But in this case, we have heard different stories from this applicant as to why this expansion is required. I have a copy of the 2008 application for the very same variance by the same school represented by the same law firm. Mr. Weiss presented it. At that time, in 2008, Columbia said that their long-standing goal was to create a middle school of grades five through eight. The present application is word for word the same, except it now says that the long-standing goal was grades five through seven. Credibility before this board is always an issue. And the applicant is incredible. The applicant is misrepresenting the real reason that it's applying. In 2008, the application, and I have a copy of it I can provide to the board, I have copies for every member, the applicant said that this increase in size would result in an increase in the student body of 48 students. This application, the same application, the applicant says that the increase will be 30 students. Now, when you think about the amount of space they're asking for, about 15,000 square feet for 30 students, by itself on its face, that, that's quite ridiculous. But if they want to create a separate middle school, they can do it with no construction. They have acknowledged that the middle school students are in the same building with the high school students and that high school students are in the middle school building. And the amount of space taken is identical. If they merely shift the high school students out of the building we're talking about into the existing high school building and then shift back the middle school students into this building, they have no need for an expansion. They have created a middle school of grades five to seven or five to eight, whichever you want to believe is, the, is their real goal. But the fact is that every time they come before this board, they say, this is the last time, this is all we're asking for. And then two years or four years later, they come back and say, just a little bit more. I just want another little piece. But the effect on the community 
in the aggregate has been tremendous. I'd like to hand up the uh, copies of the 2008 application so that you can see for yourself discrepancy. It is the same application word for word. They just changed the number of students and the number of grades. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Holly Hughes. I live at 333 Central Park West, which is at 93rd Street. Uh, and I am one of the people who is with the West Side Organization for Responsible Development. The requested, uh, per I believe the directions of this board, that we have a meeting with uh, representatives of the school administration. We made ourselves, we thought they were supposed to contact us. When they didn't, we tried to contact them. Uh, they, we were told that they couldn't meet until after this session, uh, conveniently, because they couldn't get their architects and their lawyers to join us. I ask you, uh, why would the architects need to come to a meeting about traffic? Um, obviously, this is a very good client for that architectural firm if they have to walk with them everywhere. They said their lawyers wouldn't be available. Why would they need their lawyers at a friendly, mutual sit-down with concerned community people to try to work out a problem that both sides had hopes we would be able to to reach some sort of a conclusion this is a this lack of dealing with real cooperation and good faith has been a problem all along uh, wh when required to by a community board meeting or by um, an appearance before your group they will hold a town meeting uh, which is poorly publicized um, so there doesn't we just don't get the idea that there's any real desire on the part of the school to solve these traffic problems. Um, you know, we are all very hyper aware of the deaths in our neighborhood recently, and there has been an, an, a case when the traffic congestion was so bad that an ambulance couldn't get through. Please delay this decision um, until we are able to work out a, a rectification of the current traffic situation before a child dies or an elderly neighbor dies because the ambulance can't get through into their apartment. Uh, I, I agree, I, I feel like I'm taking my life in my hands when I walk in these congested streets. Uh, we would like to know that there's no more SUVs idling for an hour and a half in front of my building uh, in the morning and again in the afternoon. It's creating pollution uh, as well as congestion. Uh, it's just an untenable situation and it, uh, w by my estimation, the number of students' hours that um, collectively are spent in this area is 360,000 hours per year. The people who live in the neighborhood, however, is 8,925,000 hours per year that we spend in our neighborhood where we are property owners or renters. Uh, I think maybe the damage that's done to our quality of life perhaps outweighs optimizing the educational experience for those students at this point. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sean Donovan. I'm a, re I, um, I'm a shareholder at 10 West 93rd Street. Uh, as far as uh, the item C or part C is uh, for the application, uh, they had sp obtained spaces from the DOT directly in front of our building. Uh, I had raised an objection to Community Board 7. Community Board 7's uh, Transportation Subcommittee is now um, put on their docket for this next upcoming hearing on the 2nd of September, a vote to, uh, in a resolution to have those signs put back um, to, no, to the regular alternate side street, because it's, it's a private building, not part of the school. And I believe that uh, that's part of the traffic issue is that they have to address. We, you know, they, it's not, it's, it's not adequate what's going on there as far as resolving the uh, traffic flow through the, through the, through the, through the neighborhood. And uh, that's the only thing that I've, I can observe. And uh, we're impacted the most. We're right in the middle of their school. Uh, we haven't really been in, at odds with the school at all. It's so this, the, the issue of these taking these spaces and uh, circumventing the community board's input on it has, uh, I think, um, put the community board at odds here. That's why they're looking to have them restored back. Uh, when they take those three spaces, it provides the perception that the whole street is the school, 
and uh, that's it's not the case. We our building is right there, and uh, it's just uh, they need it, things need to be kind of tamped down. I think as it stands right now, uh, all I'm asking is is that uh, if you would this this decision be postponed, or if they go back and revisit it after after reviewing some some further things, I don't think they've adequately answered item C for their application. Thank you. Any further speakers? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my name is Ray DiPrinzio. I'm a member of the board of 327 Central Park West. Um, we are at the corner of 93rd um, and Central Park West and directly adjacent to Columbia Grammar. Um, I'm also a member of the organization of the, uh, the West Side organization that have been involved um, uh, in this effort um, in working with Community Board 7 and, and with your organization. I just want to reiterate for the record um, the comments that you've been hearing with respect to um, the school's um, involvement with the community um, and their attempts, um, or lack thereof, frankly, at uh, mitigating the traffic situation. I happen to be a private school parent of, of two students, so I'm pretty familiar with the um, issues associated with drop-off and pick-up um, in a community um, such as Columbia's. And um, I'm also a project finance um, expert, and I'm very familiar with traffic issues and traffic mitigation measures when applying for variances and environmental impact statements um, for facilities like that. And it's very clear to me that the efforts that Columbia has put in place um, are frankly quite lacking and, and if anything, non-existent. Um, we we see the traffic coming in day in and day out, um, and all we've seen are, um, in effect, additional um, staff of the school that simply stand at the corner of 93rd and Central Park West um, and just simply allow the flow of SUVs um, and other vehicles to come through. With respect to the uh, additional spaces that they've taken on the street, which pati what's particularly um, uh, infuriating about that is that what we see happening in those spaces are SUVs that simply sit there and idle, uh, waiting for students to come out. Um, and it doesn't just simply happen during drop-off um, and pickup. It also happens into the evening during athletic events or other events um, that are taking place. And again, we're seeing no effort on the part of the school, very, very um, disingenuous attempts um, to either tell us they can't make schedules. Um, the, their ability to simply notify residents of this surrounding um, area of when they're having a meeting um, is just lacking. We, we don't get things. We have to figure out um, through other channels what they're doing. And there's been um, just a consistent lack of genuine involvement um, on these traffic issues. Setting aside all of the in discrepancies um, that really have accompanied what has been an expansion from 400 um, to over 1,200 students and on the face of it right now what they're asking for what clearly allows for additional expansion not just simply for 30 students but classrooms that go beyond that so um, I thank you for your time and uh, appreciate your consideration to delay this application at this point until the school makes a genuine attempt to address these issues and be involved um, with the community on these matters thank you, thank you. any further speakers mr. Weiss <coughs> So, um, I remember when uh, Vice Chair Collins asked you to get together with the community group, and why, did not, why didn't that happen? Um, Mr. Reyes contacted me about three weeks ago to get together to discuss the variance application, and quite frankly, the timing was really wrong for him to do that over the summer. Please. I mean, you know, it, it was the summer months. I had a vacation. The architects were away, um, and and Dr. Sahoyan was away, uh, so we couldn't do it. But I, I think there's something that I, I really want to emphasize about this traffic situation and um, what the school has done and what we're continuing to do. The school, several years ago, retained Sam Schwartz as the board as a we're one of the premier traffic consulting firms in the city to try to come up with some solution to what is a serious concern and dilemma, not only for the host community of the school, but for the school itself. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's a fact of life, given the fact that we have an institution like this that's, that's permitted by right in the midst of a residential area, that, that there are certain conflicts, there are certain impacts that will occur, and one has to strain to see how we can deal with it. 
Uh, the Schwartz firm did come up with some solutions. One of them was to expand the, no, the, the school zone parking. And so I, I was a little surprised now to hear the objections to that because the school zone parking for the blocks on which Columbia Grammar uh, is located is half what are the DOT guidelines that they would allow for square footage of school zone parking. So we implemented that. Uh, this, the community now is not happy with it. Uh, it's, it's something that's pretty basic in terms of how you try to deal with traffic impacts of a school, whether it's a public school or, or a private school in, in, in a populated urban area. But beyond that, the, the Schwartz firm is still under contract with Columbia Grammar, and we've told the board, and, and the community is aware, Mr. Reyes certainly is aware, because we've had conversations. He called me just... Uh, two weeks ago when we discussed all of this again, that they, come the school year, when the school is operational again, they're going, they're going to undertake a further study, the, the Schwartz firm, and, and see what we can do to come up with other solutions. But there's something that I have to say, and then the rest I'd like to leave for a, a further written submission. The testimony that we heard this morning as was a testimony that we heard at the first hearing was cumulative. You didn't hear anything new this morning. And what we heard was a concern about traffic conditions and operational conditions that relate to the existing operation of the school. And we don't deny it should be a concern, and we have to deal with it. It doesn't bear upon this variance application. The board has not heard anything credible from either their consultant, Mr. Limonides, who in fact, uh, I <laughs> cited Wikipedia for determining certain of, of the factual basis of his report to the board. Uh, the, you haven't heard anything that creates a nexus between this proposed variance and these traffic conditions. We have to deal with it for a lot of different reasons, but unrelated to this variance application, although we do respect and I've been appearing before this board for 29 years now. We do respect that the board, separate apart from what may have direct bearing upon what's before you, you have a concern and sensitivity to issues that may arise with respect to applicants, and we will deal with it. I promise this board we will continue to deal with it, but it has no bearing on this application. With that, um, if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to address them. Commissioner Martin. I have one comment. Um, we, you know, Considering that you're saying that you're going to, going to increase by 30 students over four years, that's a minimal impact in my opinion. But I do have some concern regarding your past growth and whether that is in line with you know, what your programmatic needs are based on like the 2008 variants. Can you just give me a little backup in terms of your growth over time? Right. and how the 2008 variants um, fit into that growth, and whether the 48 students was exceeded, because I would like to put that in context in terms of relying on the 30, the number of students now. Yes. So we have to turn the clock back about 250 years, because the growth of this school started way back then when, when the school was first founded and then the mid-1800s when, when it located at, at first to, 90, uh, to 93rd Street. So what, what you see is actually something that was very gradual over several centuries. With respect to the uh, 2008 application, that was an application that was withdrawn. We didn't go forward. And we didn't because as it was actually on the eve of the board ready to hold your hearing, the trustees of the school determined because of the economic circumstances at the time, it, wa it wasn't plausible to go forward with the application to largest building at that time. So what you heard, the testimony you heard about the prior application was an application that was actually never heard by the board. And yeah, over, over the last several years, when we determined to come back to the board, we refined the application. The school made some different judgments. The, the physical plans changed somewhat from what was filed in 2008. And, and also in terms of how we were defining uh, how we were going to go forward, including the structure of the middle school. There is no difference. There is no distinction 
there is no disparity between that earlier application and this application that the focus of the applications were and are the establishment of a middle school and in our supplemental submission you have some ancillary documents that talk to the fact that pedagogically that's what we need to do the the school as it exists now without a middle school is the European model. Something that has fallen to serious disfavor here in, in the American educational system, uh, particularly over recent years. And what the school is striving to do now is to bring itself into the 21st century in terms of the way it structures the school and it teaches its students. I wasn't aware that the, that application was withdrawn. Yes. Okay, thank you. Do the commissioners have any other further questions? What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to um, submit to us in writing um, the issues that have been raised, um, raised here today. I also um, would urge you to meet with the community group between now and your submission date. And I want you to report back to us um, about how you have decided to move forward with the traffic situation. I think it's important um, in terms of the community being uh, uh, having some some sort of comfort level um, I have been down the street when <laughs> those those cars are there and I, I understand this but I think that the frustration um, that you're seeing today is perhaps because um, they feel that some of their concerns have not been heard so um, in the spirit of what um, Vice Chair Collins had asked you to do I would appreciate you reaching out to the community group and meeting with them to discuss these things and include that in your submission. Could you give me 15 seconds? And I, I want to do something. Starting right now. <laughs> I'm going to rearrange a vacation I had scheduled for next week. We will, make, we will meet with them next week, and I'd like two weeks to make the submission. I would ask, though, that we, the, the board today keep the record open, but please close the hearing, uh, because what you heard today was cumulative. You really heard nothing new. But we will report back to the board, and we will then, in writing and in great detail, let the board know what will be going forward in terms of addressing this traffic, uh, this traffic issue. I think that that's, that's reasonable. Um, I would also like to hear from the opposition as well. So we'll set a schedule that um, you can, can you submit to us, <coughs> let's say September 16th, will that give you enough time to put yes. all of your ducks in a row? Yes. And um, the opposition, September 23rd. And I, um, I think that we can probably vote this out October 7th. Thank you, Commissioner. Motion to close. Commissioner Hinkson? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Atley Brown? Aye. Thank you. Item number 30, 350-12BZ, 532nd Street, Brooklyn. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. Mr. Lobel, you heard our comments from yesterday. I did. <laughs> uh, uh, we have reached out to um, DOB concerning the preemption issue. Um, so perhaps you could um, speak a little bit about that and, and give us an overview of the cases that you've cited. Sure. That would be helpful. So as was requested by the board at the last hearing, we dug deeper as far as the preemption issue was concerned. And so upon reviewing a lot of this case law, um, made our determination that federal preemption applied. What was most compelling is that there is a line of cases which look not at land which is currently owned by the federal government, but which is part of a larger regulatory uh, environment which the federal government exercises control. And so the line of cases essentially indicates that if the federal government receives property from the states and it is then uh, utilized by the federal government that absent a specific authorization to the contrary um, the jurisdiction over that property has been ceded to the federal government so 
the issue was complex because uh, in because the it would you would imagine that once the land in question is reverted to municipal ownership or private ownership that federal regulatory schemes would not necessarily apply but most compelling here was the fact that there was property owned not merely by a municipality but even owned by private individuals and if such property was part of a federal federal regulatory scheme the federal government still exercised control to the exclusion of local and state regulations, including zoning. So most but not necessarily wholes wholesalely to the exclusion of. It's just that the municipalities' uh, regulations could not interfere with in conflict. The purpose and be in, co in conflict. Correct. With so we found most compelling this case, Save Our NTC versus San Diego, was one which we cited and relied upon heavily in our brief. And it's basically a case which arose out of uh, the city of San Diego in 2003. And there was a, a federal base there that was closed. That was under a piece of legislation, the Federal Base Closure Act. And so there was a redevelopment plan which involved, and I included the information, but multi-story buildings, apartment hotels, an entire business district, really. And so the local municipality and, and representatives, through a public proposition, uh, imposed a height limit, which is essentially a zoning limitation. And so the California Appellate Court looked at that zoning regulation and basically set out that because this property had been ceded by the local state the state authority to the federal government for use as a federal base and had never been specifically ceded back that the redevelopment plan controlled and any local zoning regulation in conflict with that would would necessarily fail so that was a case where the land was ceded to a municipal authority we also found cases in new york breeze versus bethlehem and i may have mentioned this if not i can brief it to the to the board which is a a case from 1991 decided in Albany County, New York State Supreme Court, where a private landowner was, through a bidding process, uh, given a contract to build a facility for a post office. And so the land was owned by a private owner. It was um, basically being built out. However, local regulations only permitted one family homes in the local district, similar to our case. I mean, we can't have community facility residents in an M3 zone. However, the court there, and this is New York State, found that because the federal government was exercising control um, through through a uh, an act of Congress, that the uh, local zoning regulations would not apply, and so the land would be permitted to be used for purposes of um, the federal government in this case for a, a post office. So here you have a situation where there's many things going on but we find compelling two things the first is that uh, there's no affirmative statement in the McKinney Vento Act which basically reserves to the states the ability to legislate and the ability to add zoning regulations and I mention that because Congress has the ability to do that I mean, Congress basically has previously um, set forth in federal legislation the ability or the the uh, the overriding authority of state or local zoning regulation so for example there's a case Illinois versus Kermagee Chemical Corp which uh, involved an abandoned chemical plant um, it was under license from the Nucle nuclear regulatory commission and the Atomic Energy Act controlled the the uh, disposition and the the uh, safety measures about regarding that property however the uh, Atomic Energy Act specifically provided that nothing in this section shall be construed to affect the authority of any state or local agency to regulate activities for purposes other than protection against radiation hazards. So it was clear that the federal legislation said, okay, if there are radiation hazards, the Atomic Energy Act is going to control. However, if there's anything else, we're going to provide that the states have the ability to, to regulate that. And so in the ensuing litigation, it was found that uh, Illinois and the local municipality had the ability to, for example, abate public nuisances. They had the ability to, um, s to cite the property for unsafe buildings, abandoned equipment, because there was that specific designation in the act which allowed the state to act. Here there's none. And um, the express purpose of the act, and this is the second compelling point, specifically earmarks the property for homeless housing purposes. The Save Our NTC Act, uh, a case which took place in San Diego uh, and 
involves the Federal Base Closure Act of 1990, actually that act cross-references the McKinney-Vento Act in, with regards to, and it's a, it's a complicated and long act, the uh, Federal Base Closure Act, but in a 39-page uh, legislation, it cross-references McKinney-Vento and talks about homeless properties. And similarly, you know, does not contain any provision limiting the use of the property uh, in light of local le legislation. So for those reasons, and, and uh, you know, we, we appreciate the board's uh, discussion of this matter, we appreciate the board's um, in raising the issue of federal preemption, we do feel that federal preemption would apply here. And that in essence, the, uh, the use of the property for homeless housing is indeed compelled by the federal government. Thank you. I, I think that we're still looking at that issue, and I appreciate the thorough research that you provided to us um, and the, the line of cases, and we continue to, to look at that. Um, I know that uh, the commissioners had a couple of other questions. Uh, Commissioner Otley Brown, did you want to speak about environmental response that we received? I, I can even address the, the issues that you raised yesterday. <laughs> um, okay. You know, uh, as an attorney representing a, a nonprofit here, we, we uh, rely on our professionals. And so to the extent that uh, we submitted something to the board, which was less than, uh, less than uh, the board, but the board did not merit uh, a, a submission of this nature. I mean, we apologize. Uh, I, I really feel that probably one of the things that's going on is that the federal preemption issue here looms so large that to the extent that uh, the federal preemption argument is availing, in essence, the board case is diminished and perhaps to an extent even subsides. Uh, and I think that um, if the board, obviously, in addition to the boards researching this issue from a legal standpoint and the Department of Buildings, we're researching this issue. And so without knowing at this very moment how this case will play out, uh, to the extent that there's a determination that the variance application continues, we understand that uh, the environmental submission was wholly lacking and that we really need to address these issues. I think that, um, that uh, no offense was meant. I think that the, a, a major discussion here is the population that's going to be served by this, uh, by this premises and the fact that there are not intended to be any children. And so that, that kind of came out in, in, in the wrong way. Um, but I do uh, understand the underlying uh, discussion of the environmental consultant and would, to the extent that we continue down that path, would work with the environmental consultant to provide more of a standard analysis of environmental conditions. Um, I would also just add, just in the interest of discussing this matter fully, that uh, two things. The first is that um, the deed here, if one looks at it closely, is actually deeds are agreements. And this agreement actually is, is quite explicit as far as what happens if the applicant here does not satisfy the conditions of homeless housing. And the conditions here really include the fact that the property reverts back to the federal government. So as an additional argument in favor of federal preemption here, the board could find itself in the, the, ten, uh, the, the uh, tenuous position of legislating or regulating the zoning of a property and then immediately having that property revert back to the federal government, which obviously would, would clearly uh, remove the board from jurisdiction over this matter. So that, that we feel argues in favor. This isn't even the nature, although even if it wasn't an absolute grant of land, this isn't even the nature of that. There's clearly uh, the intention of the government to take and to keep and maintain control of this property. Um, and that is further supported by the fact that under the McKinney-Vento Act, properties can be deeded, but they can also be leased or permitted, which obviously would involve a relationship which has broader implications for ownership. And the, the property can be owned by the federal government and leased to the applicant, which would clearly mean that ownership still lies with the federal government. The fact that there is no distinction made between those methods of ownership, I think, further mitigates in favor of a finding of federal preemption here. And the, the other thing I would just say with regards to the environmental condition is that there was findings with regards to um, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development that the land was um, suitable for homeless purposes. There were environmental findings with regards to that there would be no effect 
uh, on the surrounding area were homeless uh, individuals to be housed here and that in essence it was appropriate and moreover the deed contains very explicit conditions with regards to continuing mitigation measures as well as an obligation of the federal government to step in to the extent that there are additional costs required from remediation the federal government even maintains responsibility to come in and remediate so this uh, interlocking of interests here I think is really compelling uh, and uh, you know aside from the fact that this is an, an interesting legal issue and an interesting zoning issue um, we do have a, a compelling need here um, which is which is that we seek to house hundreds of homeless individuals at the property so um, you know we remain subject to the board's discretion as far as scheduling and you know, look forward to resolution of this matter commissioners do you have any further questions well the only comment I have is that what you're still here before is for a variance and we have findings to make so you know I agree with Commissioner Otley Brown that you know in terms of the C finding we need more information in terms of what's in the immediate area and a better description than just an area map with everything colored purple right um it's it is um well i guess maybe what i would address is the fact that there is case law which supports actually a granting of a, a variance or specifically a special permit even in light of the preemption issue which is one of the cases we cited which involved the federal telecommunications act and despite the fact that the court in that case and i have the site here Right. Uh, despite the, the fact that the case involved a, uh, a and I'll, I'll add the site in my, in my next submission, the, the, despite the fact that the court found that the TCA, the Telecommunications Act, applied, the zoning board was found to be within its authority to grant a special permit in favor, basically in the interest of judicial economy, knowing that the use would be permitted. So understanding that and subject again to the further uh, research and, and discussion, um, we will uh, we'll discuss a little bit more about the C finding. Without without um, ceding any uh, any um, argument that uh, that local zoning regulation wouldn't apply. I mean, we still kind of maintain that and and need to flesh that out a little bit. Uh, anything else? Are there any speakers on this item? Any speakers? So I think um, since we want to hear back from the building department, we should give them a little bit of time. Um, how long do you need to make a, a submission if you want to make an, another submission? Yes. Um, I think I wouldn't mind discussing uh, a little bit, a little bit more in depth some of the uh, brief points that were raised today. Um, uh, I'm most interested in in, uh, in providing some supplemental information with regards to the environmental conditions, as as was highlighted by uh, Commissioner Otley Brown. Um, so I would I would ask for a submission date uh, in mid September, um, at which point we would submit uh, further environmental materials, but more more importantly, submit with regards to the preemption issue and further discuss, for example, the applicability of the Save Our NTC case in light of the uh, citing of the federal base closure act so uh, to the extent that we we have the opportunity to be heard in September that's great uh, obviously we have you know it's it's a continuing discussion exactly um, I'm inclined to think that it may take the building department a little bit longer so um, how about a submission date at, on the 23rd of September that would give the that good DOB time enough to get back to all of us and then you can respond to to what they're saying. Sure. So can you just give me again the the proposed schedule? The twenty third would be for our submission. The twenty third would be for for your submission. Okay. Um, we'll talk to DOB and see if they can submit something by the sixteenth. Okay. Um, and then we can put you on October seventh. Does that work? Okay. That that would be great. Thank you. Item number 31, 155, 13BZ, 1782, 84 East 28th Street, Brooklyn. Good morning, Mary Geraltman from the Office of Frederick A. Becker. Good morning. Uh, you are requesting an adjournment? That is correct. If we could have an adjournment until October 21st, we'd appreciate it.
Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Submission date? Oh, uh, do, are you making a submission or are we just? Yes, please. Uh, um, so you'll submit, let's see, uh, on the 23rd of September? Can you do that? That's two weeks before. Two weeks before? If we could do two weeks before, weeks before, before so October 21st. Of right. <laughs> yeah, the 7th of, of October. That would be October fine. 10-7, 10 10 10-21. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 32, 185, 13BZ, 97 Franklin Avenue, Brooklyn. Hello, good morning again, Eric Palatnik. You heard our comments yesterday? I heard your comments, and uh, to, to answer the, the comment about the plan set, uh, there should not have been an entrance uh, to the underneath the patio in the back, I think the question was. I think I believe Commissioner Montanez had it. The, the, the question about the stairs. That was no. last time. Okay. I thought you took that out. We did. I thought, I thought that was your question. No. Okay. If I may ask then, what was your, what I think was your question? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the question was now you've, you've sort of got this depressed area at the rear and you've got stairs descending into Right. That's that what I thought area. you were talking about. Yes. Um, and, and that's somewhat new. And then you've got, um, it didn't appear that you actually had a connection between that area and the cellar. We don't. I, the reason, the stairs, that was where I was going, and I thought that was your question, I apologize. Uh, there was an error. The stairs should have been going up. They show them going down. The stairs are supposed to be going up to the patio level at, at the first, the service is the first floor so they could access the rear yard. Uh, so there should have been external staircases going down from the raised area, the rear, down to the rear yard. And okay. instead the architect put them in, shown going down. So we will be happy to amend the plans to remove the staircase that shows it going down and instead show it going up from the ground elevation to the first floor. And that entire space is, including the cellar, is, is accessory to the second and third? Yes, but not the space underneath the patio. The space underneath the patio is just dead space, basically. Okay, and, but what is above, is, is there a, there's nothing above that? There's, a, there's the walk out from the first floor, there's a patio area from the first floor. Okay. So there's, the guess, there's a raised patio at the second floor, I, at the I first floor, off the first unit. I guess my question is then, um, perhaps DOB needs to take a look at that in terms of whether not the space underneath that, that terrace, that dead space below there, might be considered floor area. Because no, it's, it's totally enclosed. enclosed. It's totally, there's no access to it. It's completely enclosed, and it's not a part of the cellar. It's, it's outside the home. It just happens. So there's, there's no access to No that. access to it's it totally at all. No space. access to it at all. Not okay, at all. So perhaps you could make that indication on the plan because it's not. It's not. No, it's not. They made an error when I heard your comments and I went to go look <laughs> at the plans. Uh, again, I realized that we, uh, the architect, made a mistake and I missed it. Uh, the stairs and to that area showing them going into the right. underneath it, which they shouldn't. I they think, should be going I up. I think DOB has language about how to handle that so that it, it doesn't appear to be floor area. I'll be happy to um, put those there on. There are some some rules about the size of it and how it can be enclosed, etc. So you might want to take a look at that. We'd be happy to. Did we have anything else? I just asked if you're where you are in terms of environmental review. Do you uh, have to do a phase two? We were just requested by DEP after our last hearing. We got a letter on July 23rd asking that a phase two report and a, and a, a work action, a health and safety action plan be submitted to them. Uh, that's being created right now, so we should have that into the city soon. Because I was thinking this area way that you're excavating could be very expensive if anything is found there. If there's any, well, we're going to be doing that right now. We're going to be doing the, uh, the phase two work plan right now. Okay. <coughs> so um, when can you get back to us with We'd direction? be able to submit within three weeks or so. So that would be like the 16th of September, can you submit by then? Yes, we can. And we'll put you back on uh, the 7th of October. Thank you. Speakers. Thank you. Speakers. Oh, I'm sorry, are there any speakers on that last item? No speakers. Thank you. Item number 33, 188.13BZM, 189.13A20, day of court. Uh, you are adjourning this matter? Yeah, we asked for an adjournment. We would uh, like a, uh, 
a submission date of uh, September 9th with a uh, hearing date, if possible, of September 23rd. 23rd. You got it. Item number Thank 34, I'm oh, sorry, item number 34, 19313 BC, 4770 White Plains Road, the Bronx. Hello again, Eric Palatnik. We have requested an adjournment. We've submitted the reconsideration to the Department of Buildings. We've been working on it since the last hearing, substantive hearing you had. We met with Commissioner Defoe once. He asked us in the Bronx, he asked us to amend our ZRD1, which we've done and resubmitted to him about two weeks ago. And he was out of town on vacation uh, for the last week. So he said, he'll, I spoke to him about two weeks ago. He said he'll be reviewing it shortly. And the reason for our adjournment request is to ask permission to allow him to opine on that, and as you will recall, just to refresh your memory, this was relating to the legality of the use of the residentially por zone portion of the zoning lot. Uh, so we're waiting on their determination, and we can come back to you. Okay, I, I think you asked for a submission date of October 7th? Uh, yes, but we'd, we would even be happy to move that up if the board is happy, whatever the board is happy with. Um, okay, so perhaps we can, if you can give us um, something by September 23rd. Yes then you can have your hearing on the 7th. How's that? That would be great. Thank you very much. And we'll hopefully get what we need from the Department of Buildings by then. Thank you. Good. Item number 35, 22513BZ, 810 Kent Avenue, Brooklyn. Another adjournment. Another adjournment. And this one we'd, we'd like to request if we could submit in early October. 10-7. So uh, uh, That's great. And we'll hear you on 10-21. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 36, 254, 13BZ, 288, 2881 Nostrand Avenue, Brooklyn, the office of Marvin Mitzen. Good uh, morning, still. <laughs> Mr. Mitzner, uh, you'd like an adjournment?